A lot of my patients do watch me on BBC Breakfast on this morning and um, they have this preconceived idea of me. So I had a patient a couple of weeks ago that said to me, you're much nicer on the telly. <laughs> Welcome back guys. Today I am actually at the Royal Institute of Science in Central London and I have another guest for our interview series and I'm really excited about this one. This young lady is such a beautiful human being and she's doing some amazing things in the media. She's an advocate for women's health and I'm proud to call her my friend. We spent the day here at a event which I'm not going to speak too much about because <coughs> TikTok but uh, it's been a wonderful day and we're going to go and do some window shopping and grab a coffee and I'm going to bring you her story. Let's go. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi, I'm Dr Nagat. I'm an NHS GP and I specialise in women's health. Also, I think most importantly, I always forget to say this, but I'm a mother to three boys. They are my world and my entity and actually my proudest achievement. And being a mother, let alone to three boys, is in itself a full-time job. So It is a full-time job and they keep me on my toes. My 12-year-old humbled me recently, so I've written a book all about women's health called The Knowledge, Your Guide to Female Health from Menstruation to the Menopause. And um, at my book signing, only three people turned up. So yeah, my son was like, humble yourself. Everybody has to start somewhere. I was at your book launch. It was a, a lot of people. No, there. no, no. This is a book signing that I did. Oh, you okay. came to my book launch, and I think the expectation was that it's always like this. It would be the same. And I it see. wasn't. It wasn't like this. So, well, humble beginnings. Humble beginnings, humble beginnings. exactly. <laughs> so, where did you go to medical school? I went to medical school not far from here. Um, I went to Queen Mary's, parts of the London, and I did my five years there. What was that like? Off. It was the best. I came from a situation where education was a real um, freedom for me. So I came to the UK when I was nine years old and I remember, and this is, there's a good end to this story, but I remember getting a beating from my grandmother and mainly because the nearest school was about a mile away and only the boys from the village were sent to the school. So when I came to the UK and I was nine years old and my dad said, go, go to school and, you, and it's for free. It was like this world of, had been opened up and it was, I was just hungry to learn and that hunger continued and then that drove me to become a doctor. I love that. So we stroll. Why did you become a GP? I became a GP because I basically couldn't do nights. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the honest truth. Really? Um, I was, do you know what? My thing was never to become a GP because at medical school, uh, becoming a GP was really uh, the... It was like the word, you were a failed doctor, you were a failed consultant and hospital medicine was so glamorous and it was so sexy, like everybody wanted to become a consultant. And my thing was I really wanted to become a gastroenterologist. What happened was, was that when I started doing nights and I looked at what the med regis were doing and I did my stint in hospital, I was like, it's not for that, you. that's not for me, that's not for me. I don't and blame you. So then ended up doing general practice and I was working in Slough and I absolutely fell in love with it because I saw anything and everything. There was so much humour, there's a lot of heart in primary care and there are so many times when you can literally stop something from progressing further in primary care and then that's it I got bitten by the general practice bug and I'm still here. Okay. Does life as a GP live up to what you expected? No but I'll answer that in twofold. Number one people assume that as GPs we are on golf courses every day and we have a nine to five and we lead this life of luxury. That's not the case. General practice is hard. I start long, I have long days, I never finish on time. I would say the majority of my time, my children will say, mummy never puts us to bed. And also, it, the volume is so much. And the pandemic has changed because of the volume has increased exponentially. Then the next thing is, is um, it's very lonely because you're just behind a set of closed doors and it's just you and your patient. So some days in clinic, I can have up to 35 patients in my room and it's just bang, 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 clinical conversation, clinical conversation. And it's very hard to take time out and go, how are you? How That's, that almost brings me on to my next question. What's the hardest thing about being a GP? Giving bad news. It never gets easier telling somebody bad news because we forget that as doctors, we are also daughters, parents, 
humans behind the, the doctor label. And I find prayer helps me a lot. So I do pray for my patients, even before I give something that's going to be potentially bad news. And sometimes something that's run of the mill for me is not a run of the mill for the patient. For example, diagnosing someone with type 2 diabetes. This is the car that Dr. Jude wants, just so you know. <laughs> God willing, one day. God willing. If people subscribe to my YouTube channel. <laughs> Yeah, when you when you get your golden buzzer, oh, so you, when you get your golden YouTube plaque thing, yeah. don't forget us little people, Dr. Jude. Oh, please. <laughs> How did your work in the media come about? It was completely by accident. I was on maternity leave and I posted on Twitter about menopause that I was seeing in South Asian women. And a BBC producer called Lisa Kelly picked that up and said, do you want to be on the sofa and come and talk about your work? And I was like, no, I'm on maternity leave. And she went, we'll do your hair and makeup. And I was like, I am there. <laughs> it was literally as quick as that. And then I ended up going to Salford City, um, me, which is Media City, where BBC Breakfast is filmed, sat on the sofa, did my six minutes, came off. And the producers were like, you have a knack for explaining medical things in a really lay form and easy to understand and bite-sized in six minutes. And I work as a GP and so I have 10 minutes, so I have learnt the skill of explaining things quickly. And essentially it just spiralled from there. And then I ended up on BBC Breakfast as the pandemic hit. So I was the same regular doctor every morning on a Monday from my kitchen. Yeah, I remember <laughs> when watching you. remembered you. watching yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Before uh, we met, I'd seen you on BBC Breakfast. <laughs> and uh, and I, was, I was just talking about what I'm doing. And then six months doing BBC Breakfast, this morning called. And I had a quick audition. And the next week I was live on this morning. So I'm the regular doctor for BBC Breakfast and this morning. And it's going three years now. I, do you know what? One of the things I love is Christmas decorations and i can literally walk up and down high streets just looking at the lights yeah and this is why these I are love gorgeous aren't they? so much they're such gorgeous lights and we're so blessed to have beautiful lights where we are at the moment yeah so yeah london is the place to be for nothing gets me lights. like in the christmas spirit yeah more definitely. than strolling definitely, along like bond definitely. street in central london exactly so tell me what is it like juggling your commitments in the media and your clinical work it's a juggle, it definitely is a struggle as well, and it's a compromise, and it's a lot of pushing and pulling and tugging, and organizing diaries between my husband and my three boys with their football commitments and rugby commitments as well, and then swimming, and then amongst that, trying to find myself and my own fitness and my own mental well-being as well. It is, I think, that when you're doing something that you love, it doesn't feel like work, and, and currently, I feel This is real life. There's, yeah, there's right. a lot of noise. You guys can see in the comments if you're telling me you can't hear. This is why. But yeah. Nigat is amazing and we're just rolling with it. <laughs> this is really, really fun actually. This is normally what I'm like with Jude. I just end up hanging out with him and having chats. Uh, mostly about life. Yeah, and exactly. that's, the, that's the reality of life. Life isn't pretty or ugly and it's not the Instagram post or the YouTube video that you see. So it is, I'll be honest with you, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a managing and a juggling and lots of tears sometimes from uh, all around. Um, but at the end of it, the product that you get is, for me particularly, is brilliant, clinical-based, excellent healthcare advice for people. And if it takes one person at the end of, say, a YouTube video or my media work to say, your video inspired me to do this, or I ended up checking myself and got an early diagnosis, and you saved my life. Well, that's worth it. it so is, hopefully, it hopefully they can hear what you were just dropping because you dropped a lot of useful information. <laughs> but there's so much background noise. I'm worried. I don't know how this is going to edit. Oh, by the way, if you actually want to get me a uh, Christmas present, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Brightling. Okay, that's it. I duly noticed. I will have to try and get a bigger NHS paycheck. Okay. Um, and then I will be getting this. Perfect. This for Dr. Jude, which is. Oh my God, that's, that's 7,300 pounds. Uh, only, that's, that's quite cheap. That. <laughs> so actually fun fact, well not that much fun, but on my birthday, I came in here, did some window shopping, they popped a bottle of champagne. I got to try on a bunch of watches and I didn't buy any. You didn't buy anything? I didn't buy any. Oh, that's but, good. That's a good back. thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what? I have to say, I'm not a materialistic person. Yeah, neither am I. Um, I. I do still a lot of my shopping in say Tesco's. 
okay. and Sainsbury's and a lot of my kids do it from there. A lot of it is about wearability, so something that I buy is over and over again. And now I get a lot of gifts, so this coat is, is from Windsor London and the dress is from Arb. And I mostly go for um, what, the, what they say, ethical clothing, so stuff I know that I'm going to reuse. Sustainable, Sustainable, right? so if you see a lot of my stuff on socials, I've probably worn it about a hundred times and that's, I love that. That's great because I think one of the pressures of being in public eye, especially for young ladies, is uh, wearing outfits twice, right? We wear, yeah, I know. Uh, I and spoke, I think I've that thankfully before. we've got so many individuals who are sort of in the public eye. I mean, Kate uh, does that all the time. She wears things uh, multiple times and reuses them and restyles them. And the joy is with the hijab, it looks like a new dress. <laughs> Cool. You are obviously a woman of colour who wears a hijab live on news and TV on what is probably the most British institution, which is the BBC, right? Yeah. Have you ever experienced any negativity and how, how did you deal with it? It's really funny because um, to me, I've always worn the hijab, uh, you know, it's something that I was doing for years and years and years. And then I suddenly became on TV and it was like Middle England woke up and said, there's a woman in hijab who's talking about women's health issues and also the pandemic and what she's doing. And I had a, a different kind of reaction depending on the audience. And unfortunately, I did get Islamophobia. I got misogynistic comments as well. And I did in amongst some conversations it was implied to me that you know there's two things my name is too ethnic sounding um, presenters might not be able to say my name would I consider changing it uh, my hijab is just a bit too much for some people would I consider changing the style of it or moving it and I think that when you look at the representation for hijab women on TV it's very small before me, there was Nadia from Bake Off, and, and bless her, she's incredible, but she was about 12 years ago. And when you look at that and you think, there are roughly 2 million women in the UK, roughly, who wear some form of head covering at some point, and yet the representation on mainstream TV is still that we're not seen. So I didn't want to change my style, and I stuck to my guns and said, no, I will teach people how to say my name and I like the way that I do my hijab. I'm a Pakistani woman, um, I do it like a dupatta, which means that it's, it's done in a style that is in keeping with my heritage. And I wanted to play homage to my, my ancestors who, without them, I would never be here. I love that. I, I really hope that this picked up and translated uh, on the video because I think that's going to inspire a lot of people to go out in the world and be there true and authentic self, so I really hope that they heard what you had to say. Who inspires you? I have a lot of people that inspire me. Um, my biggest inspiration is my mother. Because I look at her and I think, how did she manage to raise kids who are like us? I mean, I'm the eldest of five. I have me, my brother, who's a barrister. My other brother, you've met my family. Yeah. My other brother, who's a chartered accountant, my sister, who's a dentist, and a younger brother, who is a pediatric nurse. And my mother never did a shred of homework with us. She wow. never sat down with us. She never checked the schools that we were in, but somehow has produced these children who are out there doing some incredible work integrating with, with first generation immigrants. So we're literally here to take everybody's job. I think basically. your mother needs to uh, write a book. <laughs> and. I think that her parenting style has made me appreciate my parenting style with my children as well. And the other person that inspires me a lot is uh, my father. But the reason is, yes, there's a mother, there's a father-daughter love there. And again, you've met my father. But I think the art of patience, which we forget, we lead such busy lives and we want to be here, there, everywhere. We want to be quick to get our point in. We want to like say something that's either going to break somebody or lift somebody and it has to be quick, 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 you know? Whereas my father is quite a slow, measured man and in that he has really taught me that there are certain things in life that I will never understand. There are certain things that are beyond my control. There are certain injustices in life that unfortunately will happen. And through patience, faith, prayer, reflection, 
actually you let go of a lot of burden and I'm still learning from him what the meaning of patience is and that is something that I think he inspires me a lot to do. That's amazing. Let's hear it for fathers. We don't often hear fathers getting the thanks I know. and accolades, so it's I lovely know. to hear that. I think that um, you being a father as well, that uh, what you do will inspire your daughters and, and, and your children as well. But also, I do think as a society, it's always like the mothers do everything. But actually, my father was the one that championed me to go off to university. My father was the proudest that my name was on a book. My father is the first person, he's gone to Pakistan recently and I'll tell you what, there's a, I was on the front cover of a magazine and um, my father brought a bunch of the magazines and then uh, took, has put them in the luggage so he can take them to Pakistan to show everybody, look my Listen. daughter is a cover girl. And I just think, where in the world would you see that? And, you, and, and more so if it's a Pakistani man who's an imam. He's so proud of his daughter that uh, although we don't overtly say it every day, my family humble me. Don't, don't, you know, I'm not saying that it's all brilliant. You know, your families know how to cut you down and ground you. Oh yeah, need to. bring you back down to earth. But actually for my father just to do that small act of going out and getting loads of magazines and then putting them in the suitcase and he said to me, look, I'm going to take these back to the madrasa that I studied in because there's lots of girls there and I'm going to share your work. That was the best. I love that. Should we go in? Yeah, let's okay. go. And so you talked about your book. Why did you think that that book needed to be written? Should we go in? Yeah. There's a lot of reasons why I thought my book... Oh, it's very loud in here. There's a lot of music. Oh, they, they turned it down They've for us. They turned it down for us. They were expecting you. I know. <laughs> this, is, this is, oh, this is beautiful. This is so gorgeous. Hello, hi. Your makeup is always flawless, so. Oh, God, uh, yeah, I'm such a flower. I'll, I'll just uh, window shot with you. <laughs> so, yeah, um, you, so you're saying your book. So I wrote my book mainly because I felt that I was never seen or heard. So look, take a look at these makeups, right? So it took us a long time to get shades of makeup that would go on my skin. But yet in medicine currently as it stands, we don't have a lot of women of color in our medical textbooks. So I would see a lot of women of color, women come to women doctors. So I see vulval lichen sclerosis, vaginal atrophy. I see skin conditions that women are too embarrassed to expose on their breasts, etc. And still we have to sort of look and find the pictures of what uh, dimpling on the skin of breasts look like. Any more, any more, or no, no, no? I mean, I would like to have more, but I think that it, it's too difficult. We had difficult pregnancies, um, and yeah, I think that chapter's closed. Although I wouldn't mind, like, uh, adopting. We talked about this. Oh, but, wowzers. But I wouldn't mind that. That's such, do you know what? That is such a good thing to do. Yeah. So in our faith and religion, they say that if you adopt a child, it's a, you get like 10,000 blessings. Okay. Um, because um, if you look at the history, a lot of uh, saints and prophets were adopted. Mm. So uh, it's, uh, it's really encouraged. Unfortunately, it is such a taboo, I think. They, we have this other thing where they always talk about bloodlines and it's better to have somebody who's of your bloodline. And I think that's, that's really unfair. So you're so cute. <laughs> if you want to adopt, you should definitely adopt. Okay, so do you see anything you like here or should we keep it moving? Uh, no, I'm not going to buy anything from here. But okay, I cool. do love looking at makeup. I love window shopping. I just wish I had the money as an NHS GP to buy something. Tell me about it. Honestly. Seems a bit unnatural to go back to your book, but I want to ask you a few more questions about that. Okay. What was the hardest thing about writing that book? Uh, the hardest thing was putting down all my clinical knowledge that I had in here onto a piece of paper and also I'm dyslexic. So I made voice notes and then transcribed that and I had um, a lovely lady called Pauline who was my lay editor. And without her, I think that would have been really hard because I didn't want it to be a medical book. I wanted it to be for everybody, for dads, for men, for women, for girls, for older women, for your grandmother, everybody in the household to pick it up. And so I needed to take all the jargon out of that. And that was really hard because to me, talking about medicine was bread and butter. Talking about various things was also normal. 
and then my editor Pauline would go oh but what's an endocrinologist and what does this all mean and so I think that was the hardest part and it took me two years and in amongst that I was still doing TV, I was doing BBC Breakfast in this morning, I was still doing long days in the surgery and I was setting up my own private practice as well as that so I feel like now I'm ready to have a break and a stop because I ran myself into the ground. <laughs> I have run myself into the ground. You've worked really hard. Yeah. Um, and if somebody else is thinking about writing a book, how do they go about getting it published? Firstly, I would say write a book. Just don't stop to think, just do it. Because they say everybody has a book inside them. And then I would reach out to publishers. For me, it was a bit of a two-way street because um, I was already on BBC Breakfast on this morning. So the publishers reached out to me and said, are you thinking of writing? And then I reached out to them and said, yes, I am. I want to write a book about women's health. But get this, I want a book with black vulvas. Yeah. <laughs> and luckily, my publishers just sort of went, OK, it's an illustrated book. And I said, yes, it has to have pictures. I want ethnicity, I want trans health, I want you know, neurodiverse women uh, discussed in this book. I want everything that I do, my bread and butter, to be out in a page that people can then take away and learn from. Yeah, representation is key. Yeah, because if you see it, you can be it. So now I've realized that me just being on TV or on social media is beyond just what I feel. It means that I'm handing on the baton to the next person. Like I'm fully aware, I'm very easily replaceable. There'll be a day when there'll be a fitter, hotter, sexier woman from a six pack wearing a hijab straight off Love Island. I doubt a doctor it. Come that on. does women's health. So I'm very easily replaceable. And it should be like that. There should always be, you know, a six pack wearing, uh, like a job wearing doctor off Love Island. And um, that's the nature and the beauty of, of knowing that you've done your bit and then you hand the baton on. And I have no qualms in handing the baton on to someone. to a shop recently and they were like don't put sunglasses on because then they'd have to wipe them all down so I was like yeah. suits you oh yeah what's your favorite style of sunglasses my favorite style I like big chunky ones so it has to be that Audrey like Hepburn style yeah these ones oh those are nice love these these are the kind of my I love ones that just completely frame your face yeah and then you can be like then you're a proper diva. celebrity Like, darling, don't great. talk to me. Do you know? And the women that I love the most are the ones that just look at you, give you the eye. <laughs> that didn't go well. <laughs> look at you, That's give you the eye, and then they're like, don't talk to me. Do you know? I love, I love the drama. I love the drama. Of something. Do you like handbags? I. What's your style? What do you think about this? I'm not a big fan of handbags. It's quite shiny. Do you know? I, yeah, because. I like clothes with pockets. I just want to put everything, and the, like the freer my hands are, the better. I've started carrying a bag around, and mainly like, look, this is my bag, and that's because I carry my own selfie stick because I would like to make content as I go along. So more functional than so fashionable. More, yeah. So I don't understand the obsession with handbags. I can, I can, I get it, but I don't, for me, understand the obsession with handbags. I have the same bag. But like, because I want to, like I say, it's I like more substantial things rather than aesthetically pleasing things that you disregard. Speaking of beautiful things, the uh, security guard said that we can't record. Yeah. Well, actually, he said he needs to find out if we can record. And then I told him, look, she is in the market for some new makeup. As you can see, her makeup is flawless. So I've accompanied her to do some shopping, but I'd also like to bring you guys her story at the same time and he said okay i'll tell you a really quick story i got to know jude at the start of the year in january and we went to a youtube health conference and i did my bit because i was on the panel and i came off the panel and jude came across and said to me you're the doctor off the tv i used to wake up and have breakfast to you and that was it i was like this is a man that i can definitely have a lot of banter with but he's the humblest kindest nicest gentleman ever oh, 
And Thank I feel you. like I'm always in the presence of my brother. I have a brother called Imran. And Jude is very, very replicable of my brother. Uh, and I think that when you meet kind souls who have a humanity to them, hold on to them because their souls are very rare to come by. That is really kind. That's like the kindest thing that anyone has ever said. That is so nice. I'm, I'm really humbled. I don't know what to say. I'm speechless. I'm supposed to be doing the interviewing. And now I, I don't know what to say. I'm going to... See, this is, the kind of, this is the kind of guy he is. <laughs> What's a good day like for you? A good day is, I'm an early riser. So the first thing I do, I always start with a prayer. So I still do do that. And I read a passage of the Quran and that gets me going. And then trying to get a swim in. I love swimming. About 18 months ago, I started swimming and I never knew how to swim before that. So I put on my armbands and went to the local pool and taught my boys and literally threw them in, threw myself in. And then now 18 months down the line, by watching YouTube videos, I've learned how to swim. And then after that, I would say having a good breakfast. I can't have a day without breakfast. And then doing my work. And usually I'm still a jobbing GP. I'm a portfolio doctor. So my Mondays and Thursdays are in my NHS practice. My Fridays are my private practice. And then Tuesdays and Wednesdays are my media work. That's when I do social content creating, editing. I have to find pockets of time, but I'm an avid reader. I read extensively. I love everything and anything and I read mostly clinical guidance because a lot of my work revolves around that. And being up to date as well, the new information, the new data, the new um, technologies that are coming out. And women's health is at a point in, a point in time uh, going through a lot of innovation. So I'm really, really excited about that. Cool. So what was the last book you read? The last book I read was by Matthew Saeed and it I've forgotten the name of the book, but basically it's about, uh, oh no, it, I think it's called Black Box. Oh my God, let me just have a look, hang on. Oh, let me just get this as my son. Hi, Haris. Hi, Haris. Yeah? Yeah, so go to Auntie Shamila, please. Is there anything you wish you were better at? So many things. I'm humble enough to know I don't know everything, although I wrote a book called The Knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> the irony. Um, I know nothing. And I wish I was, I wish I was more arty. I wish I was um, sort of, you know, great into my fitness and, and things like that. I, I don't get obsessive about things and I wish I was a bit more uh, focused sometimes. I definitely wish I mean, like always, I always think, I wish I was skinnier. Uh, that sounds awful, doesn't it? But I think there's a real thing about that, especially when you're working telly, that the way you look has to be perfect. I've made my peace with it. I mean, bit. that's interesting because I'm sure there are a lot of women who watch you and think how glamorous you are and how you must have everything together and how much they wish they looked like you. Oh, that's and so kind. Meanwhile, you have your insecurities like I, everybody else. I, I do because the thing is, is that I've always been so like ages ago, I remember going and somebody said to me, your face just doesn't fit what we're looking for. And I think even now people get the impression that I'm unapproachable and quite scary. And I don't know whether that's because I'm a doctor now, but I think really? that's just in my family or like does it no, look Yeah, my sister, my sister's like you People, you come across as quite scary until people say hello to you and get to know you. But if they just saw you, you're quite unapproachable. Yeah, I, I think people think that about doctors yeah. for some reason. Yeah. Like once you become a doctor, it's but like you a, must as, take yourself really seriously. Yeah, yeah. But as a black man, you trying to get an education from the rough ends, was that, that must have been tough. So, sorry, say that again? So I was just asking you, like you as a black man, yeah. leaving the East End of London, yeah. To do medicine. Uh, and you're the only doctor. Yeah. Like, that's still tough because, you know, black medics are still in the minority in the country. Yeah. It was difficult. I mean, it's difficult, I think, being black in medicine because I think hopefully it's better now because there's more representation. But for a lot of time, you feel like culturally a bit othered, is mm, a word. Like, mm. I just felt like a lot of it wasn't aimed at me or for me, um, a lot of the, the our professors at med school were completely like disconnected. It was, 
it was a weird experience, particularly because I left London, as I said. So it was just very different to anything I was used to as an 18 year old. But I think ultimately it was the right decision because I just thought in London there'd be too many distractions. Mm. We've had this discussion before because we were talking about being a black surgeon and experiencing racism. Yep. Do you find that um, when you were at medical school that it was worse? No. Okay. Uh, I think at medical school I, I, I may have just been blissfully unaware. Okay. I, I don't think I really experienced racism at med school. I did actually, but not at med, not from medical school, just mm -hmm. because I was in the north part of the country mm -hmm. and some of the local towns that I was posted to, mm -hmm. I would just experience like open racism on the street. Right. Uh, which was strange coming from London. Was there ever a pushback from, say, other black men to say, why are you going to university? And no, actually it was the opposite. Really? Like, I'd be congratulated. People would be like, oh my God, you're a medical student? Like, fist bump, high five, like, oh, you know, okay. representation is important. It's good to see, you know, people making it up and out and mobilising and stuff. So, uh, yeah, it was the opposite. I felt proud. I felt that, like, I was, um, you know, representing my community of East London when I went to you Manchester. Know. Well, I, I also got to do my elective at Yale. I never forget. Oh wow! And, yeah, yeah. and I was a square from East London, and I was at Yale med, uh, med school. Yeah. And I just thought, Jesus, I've come a long way, and it was just felt like really important to represent. So um, I don't know if you feel that pressure. Do you feel like in? I definitely there was a sense of like, you know, why are you getting an education as a girl when you're just expected to get married and have children? And remember, I come from a community where there's still arranged marriages. And there's nothing wrong with arranged marriages. I've had an arranged marriage myself after I got a medical degree. But it was seen as um, still when I was growing up, because um, I went to medical school in 2002, and it was seen as something that, uh, you know, it's, it's okay for boys to do this, but girls, not so. Yeah. And I think also it was more, it wasn't anything to do with faith. It was more to do with the expectations of girls and culture um, and the societal gender roles that we had for girls. The faith doesn't stop you, like Islam doesn't stop you from getting an education at all. In fact, in Islam, it's um, mandatory that girls are educated just as much. It's the cultural aspect, um, the patriarchy that plays a role. If you were a superhero, what would your superpower be? I definitely would want to have the superpower of flying. I just think flying is amazing. I look at birds and they're so, so beautiful. Um, so, and I'd love the idea of getting to one place and another and not having to pay for flights or go through check-in or do anything else. So flying is definitely a superpower I'd love. And the other thing that I would love to have a superpower is I suppose meet my heroes from time. I know that sounds really weird, but go back in time and go for, forward in time, if that's okay. Okay, time and, traveling. And time traveling, time, yeah, time traveling. Oh my God, there's a car that you'll absolutely love. <gasps> my kids would oh love a car God. like that. I'm gonna have to take that's a Lamborghini, Sorry. I'm not sure which one it is, but that is Sorry, fun. so time, time traveling, and the reason I want to do time, the, the reason I want to do time traveling is literally just so I can go back and forward to meet heroes and be like, teach me, teach me, I want to learn from you and meet my heroines. Uh, from the past. And I think you mentioned, you might not be able to remember it now, but we were talking and the sound got a bit crazy, so we stopped, but you were mentioning that somebody said that your face didn't fit. Yeah, some... so we were talking about, um, you know, what is it like being a, a woman of colour um, when you're not seen or you're seen as hidden women. And um, growing up, I obviously don't have blonde hair and blue eyes. And so when I was ever in some spaces, and I remember uh, very early doors actually, so when I started doing media, it was just implied that for certain documentaries or for certain media roles, um, my face just doesn't fit the aesthetic that they're looking for. And yeah, I wear a hijab and I'm a darker complexion. And there are certain things that you then start not to like about yourself because you just want to be normal and fit in. And so I've grown to love my nose. I used to hate my nose. I've grown to love my cheekbones. Growing up, I used to hate my lips. Uh, thank God for the Kardashians, <laughs> because they made having big lips uh, something that everybody's now getting fillers People for. People are paying to look like I you. Know. 
<laughs> I, God, I don't know why. But I think that that insecurity of your body and the way you look, you come with time to accept yourself. And so I see, especially on social media, where everything is airbrushed, your wrinkles are taken out, and um, youth is still prized. And so when you are looking for the perfect aesthetic uh, and you don't see yourself there, the only thing to do is to create that space. So I literally go into rooms, put my elbows out and make a room space for I myself. I make my own content to put my face out there because the biggest thing I get is the fact that I know that nine-year-old me would have appreciated that. So I hope other nine-year-olds would appreciate someone who looks like them. Do you have any regrets? I have a lot of regrets about a lot of things. I have, a, I have regrets over time that I've wasted on trying to change things about me physically, which I can't. And I often thought to myself, I wish I was a boy because I never was encouraged to have an education. I was never encouraged to go to school, although I have this amazing brain. And uh, um, being a... Uh, a man just seems so much easier and when you're younger you know from the age of like 12 you understand what pain is but now that I'm older my regret is I don't know why I wasted time thinking I wish I was a boy I'm actually really happy that I'm a woman and in the body that I've got because this body produces life exactly. it has a brain that is able to think and be creative and give other people the knowledge that they can then light their candle in it yeah. <laughs> the other thing that I regret is thinking that I'm the be-all and the end-all. I want everyone to watch this and know that you are totally replaceable. Failure is not a bad thing. Never be ashamed of your mistakes. Own them and learn from them. But also know that you don't have to work those extra hours and those extra days and miss the, you know, the school drop-offs and the nightly feeds or the bedtime routines and the bits that make you feel alive and make you feel human. You are totally replaceable in every little thing that you do. And so it's so important that you do your little bit and then you move on and you hand on the baton because there will be always someone to fill your role. But do not kill yourself in that role thinking it ends with you, it doesn't. Their boots, their yeah. boots with heels. Well, it's nearly home time and I really have enjoyed spending the day with you. I'm getting to know a bit more about the person who is Dr. Nega. Oh. And, you know, we saw you on a red carpet. Well, we see you on red carpet events all the time. Now. Yeah, you're, you're the, the NTAs, I would say, the was the glitzy. It's, um, so the National Television Awards, I felt so glam that day, but so out of place as well at the same time. It was quite scary. You shouldn't feel out of place. But my question is, like, obviously, you know, you, you're living, like, almost like a double agent now. You've got your <laughs> NHS job, which is not glamorous at all. Yeah. And then, you, you know, you've got your part-time, you know, red carpet event. Um, do your patients ever recognise you? And, like, does that ever affect the dynamic? <laughs> do you know what? It's really funny because a lot of my patients do watch me on BBC Breakfast on this morning, and um, they have this preconceived idea of me. So I had a patient a couple of weeks ago that said to me, you're much nicer on the telly. <laughs> oh, wow. I know. So, or they'll, or they'll say that they've seen you. And then on the whole, my patients are so protected, protective of me. Um, and they feel like because I'm their GP and I look after them, they in turn look after me as well. Okay. So that's quite nice. Um, what's it like being on BBC Breakfast News? I started in the just before the pandemic and then within the pandemic itself. I love BBC Breakfast. I love this morning as well, um, but that's where I really started at the BBC. And there's no better learning ground of how you communicate, how you get across medical information in bite-sized information. Yeah. And the production team behind the camera, the editing, everything. I mean, it's a machine. The BBC is a machine, just like the NHS is a machine. And I just feel I'm a tiny, tiny little cog in it. And that's about it. And it's important to have doctors on TV delivering information that is reliable and credible. What's one piece of medical advice you wish more people knew? The thing I always wish that people knew is that your lifestyle underpins almost every single diagnosis that we have on the majority of the time. And the way that you can look after yourself is underpinned by your lifestyle. And that's such a huge topic in itself. There is now something called lifestyle medicine. But what you eat, your work-life balance, how much you sleep, 
what you're eating, the nutrition, um, your mental well-being. There's no disconnect between the head and the body. All of that is so pivotal to how you look after yourself and if you feel healthy or not. That is brilliant. And actually, even as doctors, I think we forget that. If you could travel anywhere in the world, where would it be? Anywhere where there's a beach. I don't care if it's the British coastline. I love water and sand and a okay. lovely beach. <laughs> and, and lastly, what do you want to be remembered for? I've often thought about this because I was asked this recently, actually. Um, and is it because I want to be remembered as a doctor or anything like that? To be honest with you, I just want to be remembered by some person somewhere along the line that said, because of her, I learned something. And so there's a really sort of, um, there's a, a scene in a movie, and I can't even remember the movie, but um, uh, one of the characters walks down the street and uh, the little girl turns to him and goes, thank you for what you did. And I don't even want to thank you, but I want somewhere to some, somebody to say, because of her, I learned about my body and my body is a woman and I felt better for it. That's all I want. I love that. That is so, that's noble. And I think um, it's, people don't appreciate what you do as a doctor when you put yourself in the public eye, in the almost firing line. I know, I so, know. And I think that the drive always is, is I want an award, I want this and I want a BAFTA and I want the millions of followers yeah. on my Instagram and I want millions of people here and I want these many books to be sold and I want this many people to um, be uh, commenting on my posts that I make and every post has to have like three million hits and, and actually I've come to the conclusion, yes, if that's your bag, do it. But for me, at the end of the day, the only thing that I want is for somewhere, somewhere to say, she just made me feel better. That's I love it. that. Okay, so I know I brought you to Ralph Lauren, which yes. you can't see, to get a coffee, and the van has conveniently covered the queue. <laughs> so we're probably, not gonna, we're probably not gonna join that queue for coffee, given the time, and I know you need to get back. Yes, because so, I'm doing, um, I'm on this morning tomorrow, so I need to get home. Okay. sort out my children, have dinner, get them ready, and uh, I need to be leaving the house about 6.45 in the morning, so... Okay. Before <laughs> I let you go, I've got a few quick-fire questions, yeah? Yeah, quick-fire. Quick-fire. You already answered the first one, but beach holiday or city escape? Beach holiday. Dine out or order in? Oh, definitely order in. Okay. Late nights or early morning? Early mornings. Predictability or excitement? Oh, excitement. Excitement. And if you could have dinner with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? Michelle Obama. Love it. The reason being is because she said something about being a woman of colour and having to be measured because you're seen as the angry woman, the busy woman, the woman that um, everybody can downplay or disregard because of the aesthetics that you look like. And she's a tall black woman, a powerful woman. And I thought to myself, if Michelle Obama is saying that as a woman of colour, she comes across as an angry black woman, imagine what it's like for all of the other women that are out there that are of colour. And I've gone into rooms where with my hijab, I've literally, people have looked at me thinking I'm going to make them tea, or I'm there as the cleaner or the receptionist. And I'm like, yeah. no, I'm the doctor. So the one person that I think for me, who's a role model, um, other than my mother and the people that inspire me, is her because I think that her poise is something that I can learn from. Amazing, I love that. And she must have the most fascinating stories. Like, like she must have the most fascinating stories to go from being this sort of couple who then went into the White House. I just think their story is so incredible. I'm a huge fan of Barack Obama. If anybody's watched the channel, yeah, so we they know how many times I've We should him. go for a cup of tea together, or yeah. afternoon tea with Michelle and Barack, and then that's it. You and I will have a Listen, chat. Listen, they need them. to tag Barack and Michelle. <laughs> they, I mean, I know I need to let you go, but I watched a movie yesterday, which they co-produced, called Rustin on Netflix. If anybody oh, okay. uh, is interested, uh, go and check it out. I just thought it was phenomenal. I didn't even know that that was your inspiration as well. So look at that, like yeah. we're in sync together, Dr. Jude. Cool. All right, well, thank you.
Thank I'm you. I'm going to let you go. It's been an honor. It's been an honor. We finally made it happen. We did. <laughs> <sighs>